Coming up on your favorite podcast, we are back again tonight for another episode of Peak Cinema. But this one's kind of special and different. This is for all my theater nerds out there, my theater dorks. If you're a sports guy and you listen to my pod, I respect you. I appreciate you. You know I do. Uh, But you also know that we like to dabble around a little bit, especially when we do the Peak Cinema podcast. So we're going to talk about a movie from 2023. So this is pretty new. We're going to talk Theater Camp, which was a kind of a Netflix comedy. This is one I hadn't seen yet. So this was kind of new. But this is going to be part of our little two-part series, our salute to theater at a couple of different levels. We're going to watch Theater Camp this time around. And in two weeks, be prepared. In two weeks, we're going to watch one of my all-time favorite films. We're going to be watching Waiting for Guffman. Two weeks from now, Waiting for Guffman, the Christopher Guest, the mockumentary that really got I mean it was spinal tap technically got everything going but waiting for guffman to me is the is the standard and so we're going to watch this one we're going to watch that one in 2 weeks we're going to do a little compare contrast we think it's going to be really interesting we want you to go ahead and listen to that Ryan also just some broadcasting stuff coming ahead here at the podcast Ryan will be in for a couch session soon Zach is coming in he went to Oakland to check out the the Coliseum so he's going to come in in the next few days as well, and we're going to have him on the pod. Tyus, I'm playing golf with Ty tomorrow, and I'm hoping that translates to getting Ty back on the podcast pretty soon. We got a lot going on. I got a shout out to my gal, Allison. I got to get her on this pod too, because there's some uh, stuff I want to kick around with her at some point or another. So it'd be nice to get her on as well. We got a whole bunch of stuff lined up here throughout the summer to try to get uh, things going here. So this should be a lot of fun. But tonight, It's Peak Cinema. We're talking theater camp from 2023. Lauren, Ryan, next on the pod. Maybe I just like that theme better than the Peak Cinema theme. I don't know. Maybe I just do. It's just the way I am right now, and I'm so used to things. What do you want me to say? It's the Tim Anderson Podcast. I'm Tim. Joined alongside... My good pal, Rhino, over there on the left-hand side of the screen. Rhino, good to see you. Good to see you, too. You know, I, you've, it felt like the kind of thing where you say, wait, no, ah, right before we dive into the pod and I ask the question, do you have the right theme? Yeah, and, you should have uh, said something. Because, again, it's just a trigger for me. I just click the button and it just goes. And I don't I don't think about it sometimes. That's my problem. I'm working on it. Maybe I need a new peak cinema not, theme. I'm, try, I'm not trying to create any problems here. I'm just No, let, you know, we got a lot to get to here tonight. Uh, we got a lot going on. So let's get the introductions out of the way. On the other side, just a fresh yawn into the podcast. The great, the lovely, the talented Lauren nelson Kane. Lauren, you're here. And if that means you're here... I, NBA draft coverage? Is that what we're talking about? No, it's not quite. That means it's peak Ronnie cinema. James to Minnesota. <laughs> no, please I, don't. I, you know what? I wanted to talk so much about the NBA, the the ball, the, the hoop. <laughs> there are sneakers involved, I'm, yes. so I'm told. Yeah, I, I'm like a huge NBA fan. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know what? We'll break it all down later. We got a lot to get to, no doubt about it. But that means it's only it's time for Peak Cinema. And tonight's edition of Peak Cinema is definitely a change, of course, for us a little bit because we're going pretty darn new. We're going 2023, a very recent film, very recent, but anybody can go watch it on Netflix right now. We're going to watch Theater Camp. Theater Camp, it's not a big actor film. It's kind of an independent Fox Searchlight picture. Again, I talked about this in the cold open for all of our theater dorks. This is your pod. These next two pods are going to be for you. These next two Peak Cinema pods specifically are for you because it's going to be our two-part salute to theater in the movies. How exciting is that? I mean, very stoked because all of us, if you can't tell by listening, we're theater kids. And some of us, two-thirds of us, kind of still are. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so I'm, I'm you're talking a, about you, right? Cause you're talking about you. Oh yes. Yes. I'm very, I've, I've been, I've been retired for eight years now coming up on. So uh, I haven't been on I, stage in a long, <laughs> long time, long, long time. You here's the thing. You have been a speech coach for how many years? 20 years. I'm going to go ahead and count that. That I see now, but that can't count that. I don't think that counts, but I think uh, that very much counts. All right. Well, we'll talk about that. We'll get into the minutia of that later on, I'm sure. So it's peak cinema tonight, but we got to get to some real things. First of all, 
this weather here in this state is out of control. We have we we could be invaded by a giant storm at some point during this podcast tonight. So if you hear thunder in the background, don't worry. It's just an apocalyptic storm that's going to come through here. We had dams breaking today, floods everywhere. The state's out of control. Yeah, I'm over it. I'm not going to lie to you. I, yeah, Ryan and I'm, wants more rain. I said, let's go 10 days, no rain. He said, no, bring it on, more rain. <laughs> I, you know, normally I love a good rainy day. I love you know, like working from my desk with with it drizzling outside. Maybe I have a candle lit. Maybe I'm, you know, listening to instrumental music and pretending that it's fall. But you know what? It's been like 10 days and I'm done. Yeah, I'm out. No more rain. I'm finished. I'll take a 20 day drought. If I 20 day, no rain. Rest of the way. Yeah, I'm so R- sorry. Rhino loves this stuff. Ryan muted himself for this comment. He didn't even want us to hear that. I'm sorry. I, I was <laughs> I was clearing my throat a minute ago. I didn't want anybody to have to hear that. It's been three months of just a straight cold in this house. You're doing great. Uh, uh, but anyway, no, I, I I could do with severe weather every night. <laughs> I love the storms. I love. You it. wouldn't say that if you lived in Kansas. Just say that right yeah, now. Yeah, I would. You wouldn't you know be why? Ta- because that's you wouldn't all be talking a do. big game. No, what do you? What do you go sit in the storm cellar the whole summer? No, I'd be out yeah. on the front porch. You can't sit out there when there's F fours and stuff like that. Have you ever seen Twister? Have you ever seen people from Kansas? That's all they do. We're gonna do Twister on this podcast, and you're gonna not be. You're not gonna be so cavalier about this the the tornado stuff. You're gonna be such a big shot. Then get your damn mic off mute for Christ's sake. Why did I? <laughs> Click Jesus Christ, what is the matter with you? I didn't click anything. You was on mute. I, you did I it to yourself. How, I don't know how it muted. Anyway, we have also one more big piece of news we have to get to before we get into the movie, because this is big stuff. This is big adulting stuff for the for the Nelson Kane house. Rhino Lauren Costco membership. Welcome. Welcome <laughs> to the welcome to the big show, everybody. Yeah, come on in. The water's fine. Come on in. Rhino. I, How I was your first say, trip to Costco? The first trip was great. It was amazing. We're very happy to be there. The second trip, not so much. Here's the thing. You got to go on the I, right date. You can't go Saturday afternoon. Can't do that. Was, That's a mistake. Look, no, we went We went Saturday, Saturday, early Saturday morning, right when it opened. It was great. Early Saturday is no different. Here's the problem. What? I went today okay. to try at Coon Rapids after football. Oh, God. I was, I was there, too. At, at like... <laughs> No, this was this morning, right? Or, oh. right after after waits when it was I was gonna get there as it opened because we needed milk and we need bananas because our kid has eaten a metric shit ton of bananas in the last week. And I I, I got there on a Monday morning at 10 a.m. Yeah. There was a line yeah. around the front of the building. Yeah. Yeah. And a full parking yeah. lot. I, I texted Lauren and said, This is some white people bullshit. No, what uh, you know what it is? Rhino, you know what it is? Samples. I look. I don't give a f about the on a Monday. I need freaking milk, so I went to festival. But the, yeah, they're telling you, they don't come here for your milk. Come here when you're ready to do some shopping. Is what they tell you to do. Ten a.m. on a Monday. Yeah, I can't explain why. All, the only thing I can think dog. of is, yeah, hot dogs are delicious there, and a sixty-nine cent soda. I mean, how do you beat that? You I'll don't. tell you, you don't beat that. You do not beat that under any circumstances. Do you not beat that? I have already uh, found my favorite snack from from Costco. What's that? It's the the Golden Island Korean barbecue pork. Oh, I've jerk. seen that. Yeah, that's good. See, I used to get that at Target, and it used to come in like the little bags, and you yeah. get it for eight bucks, fifteen bucks. I get three times the size at Costco. I'm never going back. No, why would you? Here's the thing: you can't go at 10 a.m. There are there are people whose literally their lives re- revolve around getting to Costco at 10 a.m. Don't do that to yourself. Yeah, and they're all over the age of 55. Yeah, you know, 100%. It's nothing but blue hairs in there. You don't need to go there. The only thing I can think of whenever 10 a.m. Costco rolls around, I think of early COVID when the people ran into the stores to stock up on the giant toilet paper packs and things like that. Ran. These are adults running and blue hairs, nothing but blue hairs running through the store, grabbing stuff like it was a shopping spree, like it's supermarket sweep. I'm, I, I just said, you know what? 10 a.m. at Costco is not for me, but Costco itself, it's very much for me. Very 10 much. A, 10 a.m. on a regular Monday morning at Costco is just like Black Friday 10 years ago. 
I, that it makes no sense to me. Do y'all not have jobs? Yeah. To, no, they're retired. How are you affording your cost? No, that's just it. They're old. That's the whole point. There's nothing for them to do. They're like, well, you know, it's our weekly Costco run. Let's go ahead and get there before the crowd shows up. But that's the it's crowd. The, you're the, the crowd. crowd. The crowd's out the door. I don't know what you're talking about. They're all they're all retired, and the fucking mall is closed. So there's nothing they can, they're not going to go walk around the mall with all they have is the what remains of Spencer's gifts, Hot Topic, and Victoria's. Yeah, Secret. they're not in there buying all the dirty stuff that's at Spencer's. Can you see some old people walking at a Spencer's right now and look at what they're looking at in that back corner? Anyway, no, they're what not do doing you do that. with they're, that. They're getting to the Mall of America at six in the morning. I know this because I used to work there. They're getting to the Mall of America at six in the morning to do their little power walk. And gossip about the other old biddies on their neighborhood or whatever. <laughs> That's, That's awesome. what they're doing. And then they're Did you hear what Bernice friends, they're is driving doing over with the her Costco. Non. <laughs> yeah. So welcome to Costco is all I have to say. Pick your spots. But Rhino, you're going to love your $1.50 hot dogs. You're going to love your 16-inch pizzas. And you're going to love your 69-cent sodas. You're going to love them. I'm all in. I'm all in. Look, we are we got the executive membership. Jesus. Uh, That's because- special. The 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 way that I've been sold on this is it pays for itself if you buy groceries there a lot and you get gas there like it two yep. percent on all on all two percent rewards on everything. I'm in for that because we're basically going to be shopping there like twice a month and loading up on things like produce that our kid is going to just run through because he's a GD tank and all yeah. he does is eat berries and applesauce, which great good for him vegan. Uh, He's going to be a vegan. Well, he doesn't like he doesn't like his eggs and he really doesn't eat a whole lot of meat. So you might not be far off here to start. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah, might be. That could be Uh, tough on Ryan. Could Ryan accept that his son, his carnivore of a man, his Viking that he tried to raise is there's only one thing. There's only one thing about my son that I wouldn't be able to accept. And that's being a Green Bay Packers fan or a Michigan Wolverines fan. All right, those are the only two things. I've got a job to do. I got to I got to get this kid on board with with one of those two. That's my mission now in life. It's my whole mission in life now. You That's said that out loud things. and that was a mistake, I feel. My like. time, my time of like I can't have kids, so my time's over and could be a thing I regret in life, we'll see, but I could still shape the mind of a young lad like young Kieran. I think I could I think I could. I think I could Don't turn you him have enough to do? No, not go, really. Go play golf. I will. All right. <laughs> enough of that. From one uh, crazy place with catty old old ladies to a place with catty young people. That's Theater Camp, the movie from 2023. Honestly, I watched this movie. And for those of you who haven't watched it yet, I encourage you to go do it and then come back and listen to our podcast. But for me, Lauren, I think this movie, it was, it was, it was entertaining. I would argue it's a little bit, it was a little bit too close to the bone. I would argue it's maybe too spot on, <laughs> too on the nose. That's Let me hear your thoughts magn- on the movie. That is why it's magnificent. So if you've ever been, if you're not a theater kid or you weren't a theater kid or you didn't hang out with them, I think you'd still find it funny, but it just wouldn't hit as close to home. You know, I, I, I don't think that there's anyone in this movie that I, I would say I was by any means. No, but boy, boy, howdy. Did I know every single one of them? <laughs> oh, my God. Just they're all Ben Platt. Ben Platt at his Ben Plattiest. Just the easily. The I must best say, I'm not familiar with him. Like this was a kind of a first run for me on him. Like, I don't but know a ton of him. Ben Ben Platt famously, I believe, originated Dear Evan Hansen. Evan Hansen and Dear Evan Hansen. Okay. And then went on to star as Evan Hansen in the Dear Evan Hansen movie. And it looks atrocious. And he looks atrocious because he's a man in his 30s playing a child. And there's some weird makeup. I Google this. There's some weird makeup yeah, stuff happening. I don't know if I'm ready to get on board with that. It's like not cool. That'll Anyways, get the that'll get that'll get the right listening sh- listenership of our podcast up in arms about <laughs> Hollywood. Can't have any more of that. I look plenty no, thirty year olds. Yeah, thirty year olds play eighteen year olds all the time. Yeah, but there's some there's something about Ben Platt playing a child. It just look. 
it did not play. They yep. tried to hide his five o'clock shadow under prosthetics. It looks horrendous. Anyways, I hate that show and I hate that movie and I don't want to see it. Anyways, Ben Platt in this, I think, is absolutely perfect. Like, this is exactly the type of person that he should be playing, which is this, like... Narcissistic? Ooh, asshole? Yes. Unlikable? Like, totally narcissistic. Yeah. Yes. Totally narcissistic, like, pretentious, wannabe actor, but is a director kind of person and i think especially if you did theater in high school you know that guy you do you know that director yes yes i love his relationship juxtaposed off of molly gordon's rebecca diane who is their head of music yep every music teacher i've ever had just infused into one person yes um i was gonna say she was like seven different people i've met in my life yeah, yeah, absolutely. She definitely like makes her own soap. That's like her vibe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just I the the scene that that always kills me, and I have seen this movie a hundred times since it came out because I just think it's so fucking funny. The scene that always kills me is when she plays her recorder, basically half a song, all yep. different sorts of flowy notes. And then just looks at her kids and says, sing that back to me. <laughs> yeah, sing that back to me. <laughs> I, I love this. I love this movie top to bottom. I have a couple of criticisms, but not a lot. I I think it's just, I'm watching it with Ryan and I just feel like what American Pie was to me, this movie was to him. Like, it's so, it's so cringy in such a magnificently funny way, specifically if you were involved in this at any point. Yeah, I think if you're not a theater kid, I don't think you get this nearly as much. I Like, I Carrie, for example, my, my wife saw it, and she was like, yeah, you know, I thought it was just okay. I guess there was so much that... And, and I guess a lot of that is the inside baseball of it, you know? I, I think it does pigeonhole the audience a little bit. And maybe because it's Netflix, you can do that, because you're not necessarily oh. selling Sorry, it to a yes. big crowd. Yeah. It's Hulu. Hulu. I apologize. Hulu. I watched it on my other thing, so I didn't. I caught it on the box there, so I didn't pay for that. It wasn't. Uh, but I mean, either way, I have Hulu and Netflix, so I could have watched either. But either way, Hulu's not playing to a huge audience. I mean, they're playing to anybody that wants it, but they come up with niche stuff all the time to fit different. You know, whoever wants to watch this kind of movie can watch this. If you want to watch this, it's over here. They mix it up. It's not like a movie that goes to theater where you're trying to put something out there that will play to. Not just the niche, but also to a general audience as well. Doesn't have to be that way. It was it, it it was interesting in that regard. Ryan, I have to get your reaction first. Just quick reactions on the film. I cringed in this movie probably more than I think I've cringed in any movie we've watched so far. Mm. I found this movie entertaining first of all, but also like. I, I deeply know everybody in this movie. And the thing that I need everybody to understand is I don't like anybody. I was going to say, I don't really love theater people Uh, in general. And I know many of them (laughs) and I love, actually, I love them. I just don't know if I like them. (laughs) Right. And, And that's the thing, right? That's the thing is I, I'm an odd case when it comes to theater stuff in that I was not born and bred theater growing up neither was i was was very much like in the jock crowd athletic like i wanted to stuff those nerds in lockers a lot of the time and look i I think that a lot of them are are lovely people but a lot of them just kind of piss me off they get on your Uh, nerves and you know i i looked at lauren at least six times through this movie and said I I named people from high school and said, (laughs) that's this person. I know exactly who they are. I don't like this. I don't like them. I don't want to be reminded of their existence. Allison, by the way, you're not one of them. I just want to point that out. (laughs) They're not talking about you, Allison. I need you to know that. We love you. Nobody who's on this podcast. Yeah, nobody who comes on. Uh, I'm just saying there were a number of people that I'm deeply familiar with who I really I could have gone the rest of my life without thinking about, and I would have been just fine. 
You know what? Okay. I get, I get, I get that. But I also feel like there's, you can tell that the, so the movie is written by Molly Gordon and Nick Lieberman and Noah Galvin. Molly Gordon and Noah Galvin are both in the film as Re- Rebecca Diane and I can't remember his name, but the, the, I'll have that set, for you. Keep- the tech guy, the head oh, tech yes, guy. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Glenn. Yes. Glenn, Glenn. So it, it's written by these people and like, I believe Ben Platt's also involved in the creation of this. So it's written by these people that you can tell they are definitely making fun of themselves, but also parodying people that they grew up around. And so there's like a sense of, there's a sense of cringiness because it's so close to home, but those there's also a sense of love for this kind of world and these people for as embarrassing as they are. They are like each other's community. And and I, I really appreciate that because I wouldn't say that I was like born and bred and that I didn't like do it when I was a little kid or anything like that. And we didn't really have a theater camp or anything growing up. No. But, I you know, I was heavily involved in it in middle school and high school. And there's a there's a love for those kind of people and a hatred. There, it's. It's very bittersweet. It's the type of thing that you talk about with each other as adults. Like, <laughs> wow, these people think they're therapists. They think that, they seriously think that that theater is going to like heal your soul. Like you we have say to- this all the time on the speech team. Do do we not, Ryan? This is our quote. We use it. We should almost make it a shirt. We've talked about theater's not therapy. And there are so many people that I think go into plays and go into acting and they do plays and whatever it is. And they do it as this thought that just like you say, Lauren, I think they think that it's going to be this therapeutic healing. I'm, I'm going to wash away all of these things. And, you know, I continue to tell you, it's not therapy. It doesn't fix these things. Cause you still, after you're done playing this other person for three, four months, you got to come back to being you. And if you don't like you, which many actors I find don't like them, I I find that they would much rather four times a year, five times a year, six times a year, play somebody else for the duration of the year so that they don't have to be themselves. And I, you, that's the, the problem is, is that the, those things don't go away. Like the, those, those feelings of inadequacy or whatever it may be, don't go away and they don't heal themselves. Theater is not therapy, right? It yeah. doesn't take the place from real stuff, but you're right. Theater people time and again, whether it was in high school or middle school or the people who go back and direct high school or whatever, or direct theater camps and do community, you know, community theater, community theater. I kind of want to separate because I think there's two very, I mean, I think they're similar boxes, but slightly different. And in two weeks, we're doing Waiting for Guffman. And I think it's going to fit more into that that box in a few weeks, which I think when we talk about that. But to a certain extent, community theater, too. Just people who are are chasing. They're just going to keep chasing, even though there's no money in it. It's it's long nights, long rehearsals. It's a labor of love. And they're going to chase it for as long as they possibly can. And And there's crazy. There's a love to that but there's also just an and just an embarrassment in it you know you see it in the movie of like you know these people kind of convincing themselves that maybe the only reason that they they aren't performing professionally is because you know they they don't want to sacrifice this or that or they're too emotional right now for the audition or what whatever it is and it's like no it's just you know it's the same kids it's, that would throw it's the same kids that used to throw the old well you know i would have been the lead role if the director just would have given me a chance you know he plays uh, favorites he plays favorites you know if he would have just if he would have just saw my talent then i would have then i would have made it to the all state you know, whatever it do is do you know what that's do you know what that sounds like to me mm. as someone who's kind of the hybrid theater jock guy it sounds a whole lot like the kinds of football players who said, yeah, I would have gone. God, if I would have just, yeah, if coach would have just let me play, <laughs> we'd have won state. I used to be able to throw over those mountains. Yeah, I could throw it over the mountain. Anyway. Hey, Ryan, you were a jock too, just like me. And I think there's yep. the great character in this movie, the kid who wants to play football with the lakeside campers. And he's just like, and he's the just, 
just plain Jane, the your stereotypical heterosexual male trying to just do some theater. And he is, you know, just, but doesn't mind a game of football every now and again, you know? And it's just, I, I flocked to him right away. Like that guy became, I felt like that was me in the movie because, you know, I, I picked up theater when I was 12 years old. I did my first play and it was just, I, I did it because I went to a play and I thought I could do that. Like sounds fun. I think I could get on stage and make somebody laugh for an hour or whatever it is. And started doing it. That's how I got on it. But I didn't go into it knowing musicals. Like I didn't know songs. You know, I couldn't sing you the rent soundtrack. You know, I didn't, I didn't know those things. I didn't, I didn't, I couldn't sing you a song from Les Miserables, anything like that. Right. Just went in there, cold red, got a part, started doing it. And that was him. I felt like that was, I think it's Devin, right? I think that was him in this movie. He is, he is that kid. That's just like, yeah, what's, you don't have to apologize. Seriously. Like, no, seriously. It's okay that you had tear, uh, <laughs> the tear bit, the, the bit with the tear, uh, the, the, whatever that the is that makes her stick. cry. The tear yeah. stick. Yeah. He's like, you must apologize to Devin. Devin's like, really? You don't need to apologize. Like, I feel like that was me. Like, I get it. Like, I don't understand. I just, they just said the theater this. kids couldn't play football. I wanted to show them that they could. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so ryan did you i don't know did you when did you do your first play my first play so there's there's kind of two two levels here to this the first play i ever did was in church shocking nobody who listens to this podcast Whoa, really shocking uh, did you play uh, moses i played satan that uh, sound that's tracking all I of played, that tracks right now we we did the a lenten play in which i played the devil in the the temptation of christ and uh <laughs> my per- i got so into the performance i wanted to do a good job that i scared about 60 percent of the old ladies who were in it did you start looking the hell with you people to hell with all was, of you it was i got really into it and my grandma who was there someone threw some holy water on you at the end of the day my grandmother tearfully this is like I'm still playing football at this point. My grandmother <laughs> tearfully looks at me and says, Ryan, I just think you need to do some theater. That was so good. <laughs> and I said, yeah, whatever. Okay, grandma. And I went back to playing football. And in my sophomore year of high school, I went, you know what? Maybe grandma's right. I'm not playing football. Maybe I'll do some theater. And I did, uh, I did speech. And then the junior year is the first year that I, I went out. We did zombie prom. So that was the, the first show that I did was zombie prom. Oof. Lauren, what was your first show? I didn't do anything when I was a little kid that wasn't like mandated by school. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what that means. Uh, you know, you're like. You're going to stand there and sing at this thing and that's it. Yeah. yeah. You're like Peter Cottontails. You're, okay, I get you know, that. whatever plays they make you do in like the fourth grade. So I, but both of my sisters did theater, my older sisters. So I. I started doing it in the sixth grade, a play that I'm pretty sure, look, man, I've never heard about it before and I've never heard of it since. And I don't think it's real, but it was called Dear Edwina. Ooh. And I barely remember what, it's, what it was about, but I- It's the Holly Hunter character from Raising Arizona. Uh, that's, uh, that's probably what it was based on. <laughs> I'm sure, <laughs> I'm confident that the sixth grade play I was in was based on Raising Arizona. Yeah, did you at any point say turn to the right? Did you ever did you say <laughs> <laughs> No, I play I played there were like a couple of people who got like a special little song where they were writing a letter to Edwina asking for advice. And that I had one song like that. And that that was like a lot of fun and I made a lot of friends that way and did the musicals every year and until i graduated high school and only did like a couple of plays and then obviously i did speech for four years so i was pretty i was pretty involved i wasn't like a how do i put this i wasn't like a renaissance fair type of theater kid <laughs> that's the next uh, we gotta almost come up with tears we need to do a tears system <laughs> for types of Look, theater kids. All, we I think ta- lauren, and I, lauren and i talked about this during the movie there, there were definite tiers of theater kids where we were in high school. Like, oh, hundred percent, yeah, hundred percent. There were, and and for us, we didn't have theater camp, 
it it was it was the Renfest kids. It was yeah. the the kids that Ren spent Fest their summers kid. at Renfair. The kids who did the all state choirs and all of those types of things. The spot that was not the next tier down was yeah next tier down. The other tier was just the ones that sat together in the summertime and listened to soundtracks of musicals and mm-hmm. became like wrote on all the songs. Like in my youth, it was Rent, right? So every kid had the freaking Rent soundtrack. And so they're all listening to these songs from Rent. And I'm like, oh, now it's freaking Hamilton. All the kids are singing Hamilton Hamilton? every two minutes. Oh, the kids singing Hamilton drives me fucking nuts. That place sucks. Anyway, yeah, I said it. Hamilton. I said it. And I'll say it again. That place (laughs) sucks. Does it suck or are you just sick of it? Because that's a different thing. It insists upon itself. I can't take it anymore. I can't take it anymore. Enough. Stop. I'm just saying. It's the same people who who threw Book of Mormon down my throat for like three years. Like, oh, Book of Mormon is the greatest play you ever saw. I saw Book of Mormon. The music's great. The play sucks. The play's not that good. The music's great. But the play is terrible. It's it's just not good. I'm sorry. I hate to be that guy. But I'm going to be that guy. It's not good. I, it was very much rent when I was younger, and then oh, rent tra- was the one though. Yeah, trans transitioned into wicked at some point. Oh yeah, um, yeah, wicked. Mm-hmm. I like wicked though. Wicked's a good play. I, I think wicked's yeah. really good. Yeah. Ryan's mad at me because I know Hamilton's in his top <laughs> two or three. Like I think when he dies, they're gonna play the Hamilton soundtrack at his funeral. I, I mean, it, it's it's obnoxious, but look, I really really like Hamilton, but like. It, I'm a little Lin Manuel. I'm, I'm out. tired of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It insists upon itself, Ryan. I'm sorry. It just does. He won't talk to me now. I, I you notice how he's not. He's not. He's not happy with me anymore. I just he's not even engaging. You. Yeah, it's I'm. I I like Hamilton a lot. Yes, you do. For many reasons, but also because I'm a history geek. Not that it's the most accurate thing. I was going to say, how accurate is that? But even yeah. so, like, there's nothing wrong with a little romanticization of history. Sure, yeah, you're that. right. Shakespeare did it for uh, years. I'm not saying. Yeah, I don't. I don't mind it at all. The 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 one that bothers me, I can't stand Rent. I I don't like Rent. I, I like Rent. I don't I love think, Rent. I like I Rent. I don't love Rent. It it really, it really bugs me. I I don't know why. I don't. I, I there's. I'm sure there's a reason. I, if I really thought about it, I could put my finger on it about why I don't like Rent. But maybe it's because I just heard it so much my, over we might my have to do the movie of rent on this no. pod so we can <laughs> no. talk about the music musical of rent just so that we could do peak cinema on rent for do we want to do peak cinema rent or peak cinema lay Miz with russell crow oh for christ's I sake please don't do that i saw lay Miz in the theater with my wife because we always saw a movie on christmas and honestly everybody gives russell crow the hard time in that movie he was fine i mean it wasn't great but we, he wasn't bad either there was nothing wrong with him it's just the fact that it's three goddamn hours and you know it's just sad music sad song after sad song after sad song and it's like you just want to blow your brains out after about you can't two hours tell me ten that minutes there's nothing that. Ro- you can't tell me there's nothing wrong with him when the guy's singing a rock style and singing stars but what's wrong is, with stars this stars is, he's fine it's fine it's not great it's fine this is the problem that i have with the criticism of russell crowe in that movie is that it's not that russell crowe can't sing it's just that that's not his voice type. It's like when they did that live action version of The Sound of Music and they cast Carrie Underwood as Maria. It's not that Carrie Underwood doesn't have a beautiful voice, but she's not Julie Andrews. That is a casting decision. That is not a Russell Crowe problem. Yeah, stop stop that's shitting on I Russell Crowe. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. Also, Les Mis is so... Lay Miz was just like I said, just, just want to pull your head off. It seriously. You want to talk about insists upon itself. Yeah. Listen, says, just I listen to Master of the House so. and shut the rest of it off. You're fine. Master of the House. There you go. Great song. Wow. You Keeper guys of the Inn. Not on the same page. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> so anyway, back to the movie. Uh, yeah. So good, let me just. Good. Let me. I'm gonna walk you. I kind of wrote some notes here, Lauren and Ryan. So I want to hear your thoughts as we go through this. So here's where I think the strength of the movie is for theater camp. This is where I think it is. I really think it's in the young actors. I usually hate kid actors. I think I've been on the record here that says I'm not a fan of most kid actors. If a kid's in a movie, probably the worst part of the movie, right? Nine times out of 10. And if you put a kid as the starring role, it probably isn't going to be good. Like that's just one of my rules of thumb, right? So like most live action Disney movies of the nineties, probably not good. Jonathan Taylor Thomas, 
probably not good. You know what I'm getting at. All right. So here's my thoughts, though, on this one. I thought the young theater kids got it. Like, I thought these kids understood the notes, right? They were... They brought in all of that, that exuberance, that energy, even that stuff where they weren't listening to Troy at the beginning. Troy's trying to get him in and get him engaged. And they're like, they're not, they're not buying it. They're not on board because it's, it's really a language, right? They're the theater speaking the language of theater kids and knowing what theater kids vibe on. I just thought these kids got that, you know, they're singing of show tunes, they're gossiping, they're just their their wealth of knowledge on the acting stuff and it, it's just really i really yeah. enjoyed them i think if there's one critique i have of the kids in this movie it's that they weren't catty enough with each other <laughs> yeah uh, yes, that's right real. yeah 100 100 percent. uh because that they, they wouldn't they wouldn't talk back like everyone would be sucking up to the directors oh god and yeah. then behind the scenes like i know this movie centers on the directors and stuff but behind the scenes those kids are I'm like next time I see her, it's a sight, and I'm gonna, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna whip her ass. And I'm gonna stand on business, and then they see each other. It's like, oh my god, hi! Oh my god, hey! And, oh and my god, that's, you're that's so great. I love your shirt. Anyway, yeah, the, the fake nice. The oh goodness, you know, the, oh god, I love, I just, I love her so much. You're so talented, and then behind her back, God, what a bitch. The passion like, and the energy even- piece, though, were great in this movie. Go ahead, Lauren. Not even, not even like, oh, what a bitch. Like, I just don't think that like her voice type really matches. Yes. God, she just, I just, she I just, just does feel not like, understand this character. Yeah. She just needs, to, she needs to like project. And I'm just like, <laughs> it's not giving what it needs to give. Like, I just think it needs more. It just needs so much more. And I just wish they'd see it. I wish they, the, I, they should really talk to me about it because like I'm from a distance. I can just see it from the chorus. I know what it needs. If we could just, just switch like, roles and just like making up rumors, like, oh my God, I heard, I heard she, her, her dad knows somebody and that's why she got like yeah. that kind of stuff. I heard she's sleeping with like three of the late lead actors. And I, it sounds like <laughs> they kind of like that. What's, what's her name? The the girl who goes off to be in a movie at the end of the movie. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, who, she, every, who, everybody, everybody would be making up the most vicious rumors about her. Well, like, oh yeah, I'm sure it's a porno or something. Yeah. They'd be making up all kinds of stuff. It's probably just a Pampers commercial. Anyway, I get I get that that's not like the focus of the movie, but you're entirely right. It would be like so, so catty. Like, I feel like if you do a second one of these, like I know they won't, but if you ever did a second one of these movies, like that would have to be the focus of like conflict resolution and trying to keep the camp together because all of these kids believe they're the best thing in their middle school. And it's but- it, like all of them. They got a lot of the little things too, right? The kids, so the kids were terrific. The passion, the energy, I mean, the competitiveness. They got, they they put them, the kids really saw the pressure with them with this. Like they really felt like, oh man, I got to do a good job. I got to get these lines. I got to do this. And I'm like, yeah, that's, yeah, we put a lot on 12 and 13 and 14 and 15 year olds at these theater, you know, middle school theater, theater camps, community theaters, these theater companies, whether it's Children's Theater in Minneapolis, whatever, we're putting a lot on these young kids and parents putting a lot on these young kids. And I, I thought that was spot on. Like, I, I really thought they were the strength of the movie. And they really, when, when I thought the movie turned and became, you know, too adult centric, I really thought that that's when the movie sort of lost steam. I, I really thought when it was working on teaching the kids, those dance scenes, those scenes with the muse with uh, Rebecca, Diane and the, the acting scenes where Amos is trying to teach them how to get into character and characterization and all that stuff. I thought those were the best scenes because the kids are so earnest in their listening and the way they're playing off. Like they really believe that these guys, these dance instructors, whatever are the smartest people in the world. And they want to listen to everything they say and soak it up. Right. And it's just like, any high school director, college director, community. I mean, when you go do a play at the high school level, middle school level, like you just want to like listen. And those kids show up with so much energy in those things. And I thought, I thought that was easily the strongest part of this one. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I also think the classes with Iowa to Beery. Oh yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> um, yeah. She's great. <laughs> what is, what is stage fighting? Can what is stage fighting? Me? Give me a definition, please. Does anybody have an answer that isn't poetry? Yes. Like a With a legal definition. definition. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, if 
I, I want to bring her up as, as one of the stronger moments, but I almost think that that's a weakness of this movie. There's not enough of her in it. Yeah. I could have used more. I could have used I could, more. I definitely, I understand she's like a, she's like a B character to like Ben Platt and Molly Gordon, but man, she is so good in like the few scenes that she's in. They needed to have her, have her in it way more. Oh my God. Even just like that first scene where Troy is going over her resume and it just says, <laughs> just says lied. Janet Walsh lied on her resume. <laughs> and he's like, oh, you're, so you're, you know how to joust. You're into jousting. And she goes, yeah, you know, it's, it's funny. So when I was a kid, there was a fire in my home. So that's kind of how I learned how to cope with the trauma. Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> learned how to joust i just magnificent and i almost again though ren fair kid ren yes <laughs> yes but also okay so f- fun fact about this movie and there aren't a ton of fun facts because this movie it got made a year ago and it's like so low budget but there is a script for the movie but it's more of an outline of the happenings of the plot and then all of the dialogue is improvised so Everything, everything that, that I love about this movie is, is the dialogue is, which is why Io Edebiri's parts are so, so magnificent. Yep. I, I think she's terrific as well. Another strength, 90 minutes. God, what a yeah. strength. Oh my God. Love how that. refreshing is that? Oh, just thank you. Thank you so much. A 90 minute movie. I mean, it'll just brings a goddamn tear to your eye. I'll tell you what, it was great. Uh, the movie does fly right by. So it just really ticks. It, it moves, which the downside to that is you don't get to build a ton of character stuff in the early going. You really don't. They're counting on you to just sort of like pick it up. Could have used more on some of the other characters. We got quite a bit on Amos and Rebecca, Diane and Joan Troy gave us a nice backstory for his character as well, which we'll get to Troy in a second, but we didn't get enough on like say Glenn and you know, I I wanted more of some of the other characters a little bit, a little bit more. I mean, two more minutes, figure out a way to work some of the backstory in for some of these other characters. I think that would have been strong, but overall 90 minutes. Love it. Perfect. That is great. Other strengths. Do you have other, other strengths that this film has? I mean, like we've already talked about, all the dialogue is improvised. I, so if that's true, which it sounds like it is, that's massively impressive. This all feels like so much of what they say and what they do feels realistic. So that's that's kind of crazy to me. Yeah, I don't know. I I, I think it's just it hits so close to home. It's hard for me to see the downsides. I understand that there isn't a lot of characterization in people who are not Amos and Rebecca Diane. And I get that that's kind of the point of the movie. It's not really, yes, it's about theater camp, but it's really about their relationship together. But I, I think see. I can, I think I can like ignore, ignore those problems. Yeah. I don't think they're death you know? nails by any means. I do. Now let's get to some, some concerns. I, I want to throw a few concerns out there at you. One, I do think it's too real. At times it feels too <laughs> real. And the honesty sometimes takes the magic of that last scene when they're doing the play and and Glenn is the new Joan and they get the great energy of the big big music number, the big dance sequence, which brings chills to you. A great, a big finale number in a musical, man, there is just... There is nothing better than that. There, th- when you're on stage singing one of those or you're in the audience and you have real palpable energy in the house, boy, oh boy, oh boy, it's so good. And I thought that was really, really good. But I also just think a lot of the downsides that popped in this movie also take away from that. Like, I think you look at that and go, God, what a powerful moment. But everything behind it is just a shit show. But isn't that the point? I mean, like, that's that's what I like about this movie. Amos and Rebecca Diane wrote the musical after they announced it. Yes, which is <laughs> they, they wrote they wrote this the most this ridiculous big, thing. This big finale, which I can't I'm talking about this and now I wonder if I mentioned it in our Oscar pod or not. But their big finale song, Camp Isn't Home, 
how that wasn't nominated for an Oscar gives me is it's like my villain origin story. It wouldn't have won fine, but it should have been it, like it was so it's so shockingly good. Yeah. You know? And Rebecca Dan wrote it like the day before or something like that. And canonically in the movie. It's just what I that's kind of what I love about it. It very much feels like the embodiment of tech rehearsal week where at at some point during tech rehearsal, and maybe this is just our high school experience, but no, no tech rehearsals like- are the bane of my existence. That's partly why I don't do theater anymore because <laughs> tech rehearsals are the worst. They're the I absolute worst. Have a have a gut wrenching feeling that yeah. what I'm about to say is universal. At some point throughout the week, your director will give you notes at the end of the show and will basically tell you this is the biggest piece of shit they've ever seen. Hundred percent. I don't and- have a show yet. We don't have it's a like, show. Oh God, guys, this is terrible. I mean, I can't, <laughs> I can't tell you how many times, even in college theater, a director who I love, who is one of my favorite people I've ever met in my life. I watched him fall out of his seat and wave a white flag at us in the middle of a <laughs> rehearsal. <laughs> <laughs> Just oh, like, no, I can't no. take it anymore. Guy? Is this the same guy who looked at you after a scene and said, "You know what? I didn't hate that." Yeah, I no, he never would it, tell you. you know, never would tell you. It. He his fav- my favorite thing about him is that he literally will never tell you he likes anything. He'll never say it. He'll never say, "Oh, I love that." Ooh, I think that's great. He'll just say, "You know, I didn't hate that. I didn't hate that. I hated that less than what you did yesterday." I really hated that. But this one, I didn't hate as much. It's There's just, it's no such thing as giving a genuine compliment in no. like school theater. No. Kids, kids today no couldn't handle thing. the theater that we grew up in. Yeah, no, kids need to be coddled now. They need to be told how great they are all the time. Man, oh man, back in my day, that just never happened. I mean, like, I don't want to wish that on anybody. No. <laughs> Like, but I, my my director was very strict. He was like, "Hey, I just want to be real clear. I don't give warm fuzzies. If you need one after rehearsal, come see me. I'll pat you on your little head and I'll tell you how great you are. But I'm not doing that in rehearsal because I got better things to do. So it's just like Jesus, you know. And so you just bring your notes. Make sure you don't get a note repeated at you. Tech week is miserable. So yeah. that was one of my things. I also felt like it was just so the too real because as much as like Ryan, Ryan cringed during this. All of the stuff you love about theater and all of the stuff you hate just come back at you in 90 minutes. Yeah. And it's while it brings up all these people that you acted with and some of them you love and some of them you didn't like, no matter what, it brings it all, though. All the good, all the bad, all the sad, all the happy stuff. It's just and it's a lot to process in 90 minutes. And so I almost wonder if they were better off being a little more broad. But either way, I was one thing. I also think that they hit on, and I'm glad they hit on it, because I do think it's theater's biggest problem, high school theater's biggest problem. And part of the reason why I think programs are starting to really shrink and die and they need to re- kind of reinvent themselves is this, that, you know, theater talks about being inclusive. And hell, speech talks about this too, which pisses me off why I think most of the speech programs are full of shit when they say this stuff. And it's all virtue signaling and lip service because they don't mean a goddamn word of it. This notion that like, hey, this is a safe space. This is an inclusive space. This is that. But if you're an outsider coming in to audition for the first time ever, Mm -hmm. such as Troy. Troy's not auditioning, but Troy couldn't be more of an outsider in this film. And he seems like the most normal one by the end of the movie. At the end of the movie, he's like the most normal person, like the guy you want joining theater, right? That's the whole point. Is you want outside audience people to come see your shows. You want them to be on stage. You want a wide net. You want I, as I, many people in there as possible. I have to say one of my favorite scenes or favorite bits in the whole thing is at the very end of the movie when they're doing the where are they now bit. Yeah. And they get to they get to the the people that Troy invited to invest in the camp. Yeah. And they said they they promised a donation and and loved the then loved the show. But they were all under SEC investigation and couldn't do anything about it. (laughs) And it was like his Airbnb bunk 
buddy or whatever who ended up saving the camp. And that speaks to it, right? When you cast a wide net and people come see your show and you're not one of these in, you know, in, in exclusive groups, you c- it's amazing what you get. It's really amazing. You could be sitting on the next great talent somewhere. You know, if if you got a football player to come do the play, you know, if you got you know, an athlete to do the spring musical, like those things matter. Well, uh, they, and I hate when, I hate when theater groups don't, don't allow that to happen. Well, and they even touch on that in the movie <laughs> and actually a pretty funny scene, I think is, you know, like you said, the whole movie they're talking about, like, this is our community, you know, we're so welcoming, you know, we take all kinds or whatever. And then Troy comes in and he's just so not that he's a nice guy. He's trying to save the camp. But he is so not that and he just doesn't get it. And he's trying to talk to Amos about solutions. And Amos completely rebuffs him and just says, you know, this is it. This is a place that takes all kinds. It takes the weirdos. It takes the freaks. And you're not one of those. You're not like us. And it's like, do you hear what you just said? Yeah. And that's that's so I mean, that is obviously intentional. Sure. I'm glad they pointed it out because I do think it's the big problem with young theater, with middle school theater. And now I would argue some community theaters, like I would argue that community theaters are, and we'll talk about this probably more with waiting for Guffman in two weeks. They're becoming more and more exclusive and less and less inclusive because go look at the cast rosters, you know, down the road at lyric arts, go down the road or whatever. It's the same 15 people Mm -hmm. every show. It's I the think same. Lyric, it's, Lyric went union though, didn't they? They're they're professional. Yeah, yeah but now. semi-union, but there's still some non-pro, non-union folks there that are getting acting gigs. And but again, it's the same ten people. I mean, same twenty people that are getting those opportunities. It's not, you know, it's not anybody else. You know, you're not. It's not a community theater in its truest sense. And mm-hmm. I think that's. I think that's a problem. I really do. I think it shuts the doors and you know, in speech, I've been working hard for the last five, 10 years to be inclusive, you know, to recruit from every walk of life in our building. And this year I actually can say we semi accomplished that we had athletes, we had students of color, we had LGBTQ, we had just plain Jane, regular old heterosexual white kids. We had them all, everybody, every walk of life. And I feel like making that inclusive thing, it's really hard to do and you have to be really committed to doing it. But it's amazing to me when you get into that bubble, just how exclusive everything else really is. And in theater, especially it there, I think it's a problem and I think it needs to be addressed at some point. And I'm glad the movie pointed it out. And it's, you know what? It's not just that way with theater. I think it's any, any kind of group that considers themselves to be outcasts at some point it will kind of loop back around yeah it's it's this like gatekeepy thing you know it's yeah something that like you know very nerdy communities tend to have you know like how many how many men in my life have i just like met or talked to on the internet who basically tell me i don't know what i'm talking about when i talk about batman or something like that you know what i mean it's yeah. like you don't you don't you're not the arbiter of who knows this and who doesn't know this. You're I I think it's harder in theater because I think especially you know sh- shows in schools and theater camps and stuff like that you pick shows based on who you kind of know you have. You know. Yeah. And so it's it's kind of like out of necessity and then it it spirals into this like ultra gated community yeah and i think i think the movie did address it in a funny way and like i said so much of this movie is both a love for this community and completely making fun of it because it is ridiculous it does feel like the same kind of energy as you know, when you're a part of it, you can make fun of it. But if anybody else tried to do it, it would be offensive. Yeah, you would get like, pretty. You you protect the stuff that you love, right? Yeah, totally. like you know, we're all, we're all a family, and we all love each other. We don't like each other, you know, <laughs> but we're we're all in it. We're all a part of it. We're all trying yeah. to do the same thing. Hundred percent. Yeah, I say that about. I mean, I love speech. 
I mean, there's things I hate about speech. There's things I loathe about it. There's some programs I can't stand, but I'll defend to the death those programs because I believe in it that much. And that's same thing with plays. Like I love, I, I've done, I don't know how many plays in my life. I've acted in a lot of shows and directed shows and I, you know, I wouldn't trade those moments. Those, those are some of my favorite things that I've ever done. At the same time, I'm eight years removed from it and I don't have any desire to get back on it. Like I've no, it's like, it's out of me. It's, it, and it's never completely out of you. I'm still really protective of it and I want it to be good. And I want my kids who are acting on stage, who are speech kids, who are on stage doing it to be good. And I want to root for them. But yeah, there's just something about it that drives you crazy. And it's trying to marry those things. Cause yes, you love it and God damn it. You hate it too. At the same time, it's frustrating. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, a couple of, uh, just a, a couple quick things. Cause we got to get to scenes. We got to go. First of all, I, one knock, I feel like it, it's a, it's almost a rip off of waiting for Guffman in two weeks. You're going to, I mean, just the, the mockumentary style, the way it kind of paces itself out. Clearly they watched it and said, Oh, we can do a movie very similar to this. And I, I think, Waiting for Guffman is the superior film of this. And I think it's trying to kind of hit on that idea. But I, I thought they could have maybe tried some different things, but it still works. The mockumentary style for this kind of movie seems to work. So I'll, I'll give it that. I just would have liked, I wondered if I could have seen something different with that. I will, I will say, ahead. so it's based on a short that they did in 2020. Unfortunately, I cannot find that short anywhere on the internet. Like it's been scrubbed. Mm. So it is based on a short that is probably, I assume, loosely based off of Waiting for Guffman. So there are just going to be similarities. I can't and wait we'll for you see, to watch Waiting for Guffman. We'll see when I see it because I haven't, I haven't. I cannot seen it wait for two weeks from now when you come in for talking Waiting for Guffman. If you don't love Catherine, o Catherine O'Hara, then I think we just got nothing. Lauren loves everything. Catherine Confident that I will. <laughs> yeah. And Eugene uh, Levy. If you don't love Eugene yeah. Levy and Catherine O'Hara, we just we don't have Fred Willard. We don't have anything to talk about. I mean, we, we just there's nothing more we can say. You're you're, you're really speaking Lauren's language with that entire cast. <laughs> she yeah, Parker Posey. I mean, you're gonna love the cast. I mean, it's Parker Posey's the greatest ever in that movie. So yeah, I, I will, will say this about the the ripoff comment. And, and I don't want to say rip off too. I just think it's yeah. I see yeah. what you're saying, though. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of similarities, but I, I also feel like the the term in the theater community would be revival. Revival. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's it's just, it's a brand new take. We've never done anything yeah, this ambitious we're, before. We're just running you know, it we're, back. We're just going to kick up a number a little bit more, a little more up-tempo in the big we, finale and everything's we, great. We have the cast, so we're going to do Waiting for Guffman Jr. Yep. <laughs> and we're going to call it Theater Camp. That's kind of what uh, it is. <laughs> oh, so it's even the best. even in that even in that sense, like it's kind of an homage to these kinds of movies, and and this idea of celebrating theater by making fun of it. I I think that that's great. I think that that's that's like ninety five percent of the humor of the theater community is just making fun of everybody and everything that we're doing all at once because this is all ridiculous. And if it's not yeah. all ridiculous, then then we're not doing something correctly. Yeah. So, all right. I love Let's get to the. I agree. Oh, okay. Very good. Well explained, Ryan. Let's get to the categories. Favorite scenes. Uh, I have auditions. So auditions many? Are, yes. <laughs> the auditions, auditions are, are great. Very funny. Auditions. The casting session in general, where they're describing the kids. Yep. Oh God. Like, yeah. I don't. I don't her believe her as a French prostitute. A French prostitute. <laughs> I don't believe her as a French prostitute. Is is the line of the film? No doubt about it. <laughs> I, love, Amos, uh, I mean sex worker i'm sorry sex i'm yeah. sorry <laughs> <laughs> they're looking i think they're casting lola <laughs> and damn yankees at a certain point and Re rebecca diane looks at the picture of who they want to cast and she goes okay but she seems like a virgin and they're like well yeah and she goes no i understand that everyone on the board is a virgin but she <laughs> seems like a virgin <laughs> It's the most ridiculous conversation. It's so just, uh, just magnificent. That whole the all that whole scene is just I die laughing every time. Very fun. Yeah, I I thought that was great. I love the auditions. I also I just loved the final product at the end. I thought the re big reveal with Glenn 
I thought the Troy Glenn relationship in general, any scene those two were in, like I loved the beginning when he was trying to talk about straight plays and musicals. Cause that's again, <laughs> it's like, okay, which ones are the gay plays then? He's like, well, those are musicals. <laughs> those are musicals. <laughs> I, so I love, just that too. I love when Glenn is playing Joan. Do you know what, what I get the vibe I get from that whole scene is when, when Roger Beach is playing Hitler. In the yep. producers yep exactly it's a uh, big hit on that it's, it's very like the energy is totally springtime for hitler and it the entire scene made me laugh for that reason i just couldn't stop thinking about how bad i wanted him to break out into the end now it's springtime for hitler because <laughs> uh, it would have been perfect but that was the vibe i got from that whole scene that I it's really a great moment because i think we all you know anybody who's ever done theater just wants one moment doesn't matter where it is. Doesn't matter how big the audience is. Just wants one time, I think, to have sort of a spotlight. And you know, if you get one of those things, it's a really, it's a powerful feeling. You can't. There's no drug that I think I've taken that can hit that. I haven't taken a lot of drugs in my days, but I'd like to think that any mood enhancer that I would take, I don't know, can get to that place. I, I don't know if it can. And maybe that's why people keep doing plays. I don't know, but. I thought that was a really strong moment at the end. I loved it. I thought that Sim- was similarly to something we've already discussed in, in that scene specifically is you do get a little bit of the actor on actor cattiness with Ben Platt's character, Amos going, Glenn is so good. And I hate it. It, it yeah. just it, it physically <laughs> makes me ill how good he is <laughs> because I've had that conversation. Uh, I've had a judging speech. Sometimes I'm like, gosh, yeah, that kid is throwing 110 and it that pisses kid, me off. A kid pisses, pisses me off. I don't like such this a bad, kid. I don't like his suit. God, he's got a bad attitude outside of these walls. I know it. He's smug. God, he's such the a good, dick. good performance. Oh, damn it. He's good. Damn it. <laughs> hundred. Anyway, uh, <laughs> least favorite scenes. Uh, I don't really have one in particular. I just feel like even even like the kind of like filler scenes in between moments are even like batting a thousand like like all the kids scenes and stuff. Yeah, like, the story time scenes don't work for me because it's I know it's them trying. I know what they're trying to do with those scenes and it sets up nicely for the Rebecca Diane's kind of skipping that, which I thought was a critical piece. But I don't know. I just thought they went on too long. Those would be my only ones that I would throw out. I, I would say that any time that Rebecca Diane is trying to be a therapist in this in this movie, oh, I, I found think that's cringy so funny. and awful. And I know a thousand of those people, and <laughs> I, I've wanted to punch every one of them in the face at one point or another. Um, <laughs> I, I oh my god, that's in one of my favorite scenes <laughs> is when they're sitting around the campfire. Oh god, yeah. And Iota Beery is like, why are you, why are you talking like that? This is my voice. This is the way that I talk. <laughs> I, just, I know so <laughs> Do you many ever want to sit people. down? <laughs> oh, it's good. This, this, Where, was, have... Tim, this was my face the entire movie. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, did you actually watch the movie or did you just hold it in front of your eyes I like just, that? I though? listened to it like a podcast. I had, there, that's a good was, idea. <laughs> there were times where I just couldn't watch. I, I had to like put my face into the pillow and, and <laughs> Uh, and just wait for it to be over. Uh, you can it. put that on the button bar. I will work. But- <laughs> <laughs> Carrie Fisher, Sebastian Stan, or Selena Gomez? Would you replace Selena uh, Gomez? I'm replaced. There you go. I replaced Rihanna with Selena Gomez at Lauren's request. Would any th- Would any of those three find a place in this film? I think mm-hmm. Carrie Fisher as Joan at the end of the movie, waking up and saying, "Don't let Troy <laughs> don't, run." Don't let camp. Troy. <laughs> I think I, Carrie Fisher. I think Carrie Fisher as oh god, I can't remember her name. The, the other older woman who yeah, runs yeah, Ruth. Camp. I think it's Ruth or something, something like that. Oh yeah, I think yes. it, yeah, yeah. Especially Gekka yelling, Gekka. yelling at Alan, the little wannabe agent. Yep. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. I forgot about him. Alan, you oh. have to go to dance class. You can't sit on my phone. <laughs> oh, well, that, such a I good bit. Have them. Could I Sebastian have them. Stan have played like Troy? No, he's Pardon too. Me? He, he's he's too, too hot. broody. He's too put he broods together. too yeah. much. Yeah, he broods too much. He can't be him. I, I feel the Gomez. same way. I I would think like maybe he could do like the Ben Platt part, but he's too hot. Yeah, he's like too. He's yeah. not, not awkward theater enough. enough. Yeah, he's not yeah. theatery enough. Yeah, Selena Gomez, I think, could play 
a number of roles. You know, she could play Rebecca Diane. I think I think Rebecca Diane, I think maybe Io Edebiri is more her vibe, but I don't think the movie would be better without Io Edebiri. No, it. you're probably right. So yeah, we got to say that. I uh, truly you wanna... believe you could have put any A-list actor in Io Edebiri's part as like the most talented person who has no idea what's going on. And that would have been hilarious because she is, I love all the actors in this movie, but she is like the best of them. Yep. And definitely the biggest name at this point. And I bet Ben Platt's a big name, but not like, not like she is like, she's in the bear and she's in everything right now. Like, yeah, that's true. You know, she, she was in Banshees of Inisherin. <laughs> Stop you know. it. Right? Our Irish queen. I want to be. Would you like to see this as a 10 episode Hulu series or yes. Netflix? <laughs> Cause it was on. Yeah. Hulu. I got to say, would you like to see it as a 10 episode series? Yes. I think it would be, I think it'd be so fun as a show. That would be it, interesting. I, I think, think you could do a like show a of this. Summer. I think you could definitely do a show on this. This, this feels like something you could run for six, seven seasons. I yeah. definitely think it could be that. Who wins? Who wins the movie? Uh, the kid, the kid actors. Kid actors win. Big win for kid actors. Huge win for kid actors. I agree with you. We've seen that a couple of times too in, in some different media stuff where it, it looks, you know, like the, the kids in Abbott Elementary are they're so spectacular. Good. They're funny. Yeah, they're good. Uh, I agree. It's, it's kind of the same thing here. Yeah. Yeah. You you're right. Big and- win for small budget films. I would say big win for independent films because this is, it's get you know, it got some run. It's on peak cinema. It obviously, you know, it's nice to see that a movie studio is giving some run to a comedy, which, you know, comedies are just dying, which we could, you know, talk. I want to get Allison on about that one. Allison, close circuit. Get, 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 get some thoughts <laughs> together on why comedies are dead. And then let's go for an hour and a half on that. And then I'm trying to, I just think hats off to giving a comedy 90 minutes, especially something as kind of niche as this. So big win for that. Yeah, yeah very much so. It's, yeah, especially because this isn't an idea that was ever going to be like a sleeper hit. Yeah, Like we said earlier in the pod, like you might find this funny if you weren't really involved in theater, but it just will not be on your radar or hit the same unless you did. And it's a very specific group of people. That's not everybody. I, you know, let's all be okay. Just FYI, let's all just like be okay with funding movies that aren't for everybody because i think that that's where some of the best art happens i love this movie with my whole heart and soul i did theater from the sixth grade to the 12th grade and i have like several friends who got a who got their degree in theater this movie really made me laugh and it resonates with me i know every single one of these people and it's not for everybody and that's okay that is okay. Yeah, we don't need to make, you know, it, I just, it's a it's a throwback film. I really believe that. It's like a throwback to when I think movie studios were willing to take chances, willing to bet on good writers, good directors coming up with original thoughts, original screenplays. It's a big win for that. Put me in the market that says I'd like more of that, please. Thank you. Yeah. More original screenplays, more original thoughts. Let let me have more of that. Give me less of what you're giving me now. Give me more original source material, please. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. We need less like broad, generalized movies that should appeal from everyone from five to 60. I'm so tired. Look, that has its place and that makes its money, but I'm so tired of that shit. Not everything is for everyone and we just need to be okay with it. Correct. You know, when you go to the movie theater, back in my day, Lauren, well, maybe back in your day a little bit, I used to work in a video store in high school. Just in my closing thought here tonight. One of the things that I had to do was play trailers all day at the movie theater or at the movie, uh, movie store, video store. So I got to see all these trailers for all these different genres. But I also, at the end of the night, had to put movies away and straighten the racks, like straighten the stacks of films. And I had to go through every section and I'm starting to think to myself, man, we had a lot of sections of movies. You know, there was comedy, adventure, mystery, suspense, horror, drama, you know, period pieces. 
there were all these different, I mean, sports, uh, sports and activity interest and leisure activity interest stuff. And you, you just all these categories of films. And you're just like, do we have all of those categories anymore? Like, are they all represented? It'd be nice to get back to that. And it was because, again, back in the day, they were just like, all right, let's, let's do a comedy. Let's do an action film. Let's do something that's kind of mindless and silly. Let's put a drama out there that's really thoughtful and interesting. Let's put a slasher film in there. Let's hit everybody. Let's let's give a little something for everybody here in the next uh, next 12 months. I'd like to see us get back to that. This is yeah, I think this is why like people tend to gravitate towards the things that like A24 puts out or Neon because major studios are just kind of putting out generic stuff. And generic stuff is fine. You know, it goes down easy. I watch a lot of generic stuff. But if you're really trying to watch something that makes you laugh, that resonates with you in some way, then the only people that are doing it are smaller studios. And I, I'm rather shocked that this movie is a, it is Fox Searchlight? Yeah, Searchlight, I believe. Yeah, because that's what came okay. up in the intro. Yeah. I'm I'm rather shocked that they funded this movie, honestly. So I'm happy that they did because I needed it in my life. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're gonna need, you're gonna love it in two weeks from now, Lauren. In two weeks here on Peak Cinema, we continue on our salute to theater in the movies with Christopher Guest and his uh, classic from the mid '90s, Waiting for Guffman. It's a cult classic. I ran through the cast list earlier. Bears repeating. Christopher Guest, Eugene Levy, Catherine O'Hara, Fred Willard, Parker Posey, Bob Balaban. The list goes on and on and on. You're gonna see a. a they're gonna see a whole bunch of that dudes in the movie where you're like, oh that guy. I've seen that guy. Oh that guy's in the movie. I didn't even know that guy's in the movie. I don't even know that guy's name, but I've seen that guy in everything. It's a great film. I think you're gonna love it in two weeks. We're gonna continue on and talk more community theater. And just talk about the greatness that is some of these characters. I'm a big Christopher Guest fan. If you haven't seen like Waiting for Guffman, Best in Show, A Mighty Wind, those three movies are some of my all time favorites. And I think you'll love them if you give them an opportunity to do so. So we'll talk Waiting for Guffman in two weeks and it's going to be exciting. Again, like, subscribe, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. You can go find the archive at timpodcast.podbean.com. You can find us anywhere, facebook.com slash timpodcast. And uh, send us a like, subscribe, tell a friend, leave a comment somewhere. We'd appreciate it. It'll be great. So until next time, for the newest members of Costco, Ryan and Lauren, this is Tim saying keep your head up and we'll see you.